ہیلو السلام علیکم آئی ہوپ ایوری بڈی از ایبل ٹو ہیئر می کین یو پیپل ہیئر می Okay, great. Uh, this is uh, Ijaz Khan, and uh, as you all know, I'll be your instructor for the rest of uh, the four days. Uh, before we can actually start, let me first uh, share with you what uh, this uh, these four days will be all about. As as you all know, that uh, the name of uh, these sessions um, is uh, practice to pass. So. accordingly uh, the focus on uh, the focus will be on uh, practicing uh, more and more questions so that uh, you people are uh, you people become familiar with what you are going to face in your exams uh, but uh, because of the dynamics of uh, this financial management paper uh, before we can actually move towards uh, practicing the questions uh in our today's session specifically uh, i will be focusing on few basic concepts and uh, the the basic concepts that we are going to study today uh, will actually be the the uh, base of the, the whole financial management so i don't want to skip those basics uh because i i feel that if i don't go through those basics uh, maybe we will find uh, difficulties in solving the questions so in today's session uh, we won't be uh, practicing that much on uh, exam length questions uh, the focus of today's session will be on uh, on the basics of uh, financial management especially uh, the basics of investment appraisal uh, before uh, we start the basics uh, let me first discuss the paper format for your computer based exam uh as your other foundation level papers uh, the financial management paper will have three sections one of which will be section section a uh, which will have 15 multiple choice questions or objective type questions with two marks each and 30 marks in total then you will have section b which will have three ot type question scenarios case studies uh, and each case study will be split into five objective type questions again uh, each question will be of two marks so there will be a total of 15 uh, objective type questions from these three scenarios and the total marks here will also be 30 so uh, it means that the total paper will have uh, objective type questions equal to 60 marks so it's uh, very important to have uh, a grip on uh, objective type questions and as as the course will progress uh, we will uh, learn some techniques of how to uh, gain maximum marks in this these two sections and then there will be section c uh, which will have two uh 20 marks descriptive questions which uh, which are called constructed response questions each of them will have 20 marks and these two questions will actually be uh, uh attempted either by way of uh, using spreadsheets or you will have a word processing workspace given in the exam in which you have to type your responses so there will be a, a total of 40 marks in this section as well so uh, as any other paper here you will have to score at least 50% uh, to pass this exam now uh, as per the syllabus and uh, the exam guidance provided provided by 
ACCA. Uh, these two uh, 20 mark question will be uh, from uh, either of uh, these following uh, sections, labor sections that is working capital management, investment appraisal and uh, business finance areas. So this is the syllabus. Uh, seven areas in total. Financial management function. Uh, from this area you will only be tested in your section A and section B of the paper which is uh, the objective type questions. Same goes for the financial management environment. Uh, the, the questions from this area will only be tested in the form of uh, objective type questions. Then you have working capital management. It can be tested in either format in either of the three formats. Uh, investment appraisal again, same uh, as as working capital. It will be tested in both section A, B, and C. Sources of finance, uh, same. Uh, you will see uh, objective type questions. You will see uh, constructed response questions from uh, this area as well. Uh, business valuation and uh, cost of capital. This area will mainly be tested in your section A and B of uh, the paper uh, and then the risk management which will also be tested in, uh, in the form of uh, objective type questions. So uh, as I told you that uh, we'll be uh, starting with the very basics of uh, investment appraisal and very basics of financial management so that when we'll go to uh, full exam length questions uh, we, 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 will, we won't be having any uh, problem solving those questions and we'll be solving those questions mainly on, 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 on spreadsheet uh, uh, platform so that you people uh, become familiar with how uh, you are going to uh, solve those questions on, in, in, in your exams. So uh, before I can start I just uh, Want any anyone if you if anyone of you uh, uh, has any questions, uh, you people may ask before we can actually start. If uh, there are any questions from your side, you people can use the chat box. Okay, I hope there are no questions. So uh, let's start. Uh, I will start from the very basic, which is the compound interest calculation. Uh, though it will be very basic, but you have to bear with me uh, because this is the very uh, basic of financial management. And and uh, once this area uh, is clear in your minds, it will be too easy to understand the full exam length questions. So let's start. Well, uh, let's suppose that um, Mr. A is considering to invest an amount equal to $10,000 today. And when we say today in financial management, uh, we denote this time by zero. So the zero represents today. That is something invested immediately. So at point zero, Mr. A is considering to invest $10,000 in a two years project at 10% per annum. It means that every year, Mr. A is going to receive 10% of the amount invested. So after one year, the total amount will be $10,000 plus 10% 10 return. The 10% return will be equal to $1,000. So the total 
that Mr. A will have up to the end of the first year will be eleven thousand dollars. If he keeps this amount invested for the next year as well, he will get again ten percent. But this time, this ten percent will be of eleven thousand since it's a compound interest. So, in case of a compound interest. Every year, the interest will be compounded. So it will be 10% of 11,000, which will be equal to 1,100. So after the end of the second year, this total value of investment will reach to $12,100. Now, the amount invested initially will be denoted by P, which can be called as principal or we can also call it as present value. The amount that Mr. A is going to receive after the end of the project will be called sum or we can also call it future value and we can denote it by S. The rate of interest will be denoted by R and the number of periods will be denoted by N. So if you want to create a relationship between P and S, it will be, the S will be equal to your principal and the amount of interest earned during the project's life. So whenever we are supposed to calculate the sum, it, it will mean that we have to include interest into the principal to get the sum. But whenever we are supposed to calculate principal or present value, we have to offload the amount of interest. So the difference between the principal present value and the sum is the amount of interest. So the sum or the future value will always include the amount of interest, whereas the principal or P will, will exclude the amount of interest. So if you look at this relationship, which is $10,000, if we add 10% of the $10,000, into these ten thousand dollars we'll get the sum after year one so how can we add this ten percent simply if we multiply this ten thousand by one point one we'll get eleven thousand and if we multiply it with one point one again we'll get twelve thousand one hundred that is the sum after two years so it means that we can multiply 10,000 by 1.1 raised to the power 2 because we have to find out the sum after the end of year 2. Since the number of periods is 2, we have placed 2 here. But not in every case because the projects will have different lives. So this will be a variable denoted by n. So the rate of interest will change in the question. Therefore, it won't be 1.1 every time. So let's denote these values by variables as we have uh, denoted the principal by P. The rate of interest will be denoted by R. So it will always be equal to 1 plus R. And for number of years, we'll just place N as a power in this case, we'll be able to find S. So in case of a compound interest relationship, the sum will be calculated using this summarized formula. S is equal to P into 1 plus R raised to the power N. So here is the formula in which N is the number of years or periods. R is the rate of interest, P 
P is the principal or present value, and S is the sum or future value. So the key point here is that whenever we are supposed to calculate the principal, we have to actually offload the amount of interest. But whenever we are supposed to calculate the sum, we have to include the amount of interest. So look at this, this example. Mr. A invests the sum of $1,000 for two years at a compound interest rate of 10% per year. What will be the total value of his investment after two years? Now when this is being asked that find out the total value of investment, it means you need to find out the principal plus interest that is sum. So S is equal to P into 1 plus R raised to the power N will give us the total value of investment. So uh, you will have 30 seconds to solve this question. Just quickly solve this question and come up with the answer. It will put 1000 as our principal. The rate of interest will be 10%, which we will put as 0.1. And since we need to find out the sum after two years, we'll put 2 as our power. And the resulting answer will be $1210. So from the same information, information if we need to offload the interest that is if we need to find out the principal now we'll use one to one zero as our sum and we'll be putting p as our principal point one raised to the power two so if we solve it for p we'll again get the one thousand dollars that was invested at point zero. So the difference between these two values is actually the amount of interest earned during two years. So from now onwards, I expect all of you to know the difference between P and S. The present value means we have offloaded the interest. And the future value means we are including the amount of interest. So we can just rearrange this formula for calculating P directly. So it will be is equal to P is equal to S divided by 1 plus R raised to the power N. Or it can be P is equal to S into 1 plus R raised to the power minus N. So can, we can use this formula as well for calculating the value of P that is the present value. So go ahead and uh, solve these two examples. You people should not take more than two minutes for solving these two questions.
May I know the answer for the first example? Oh, great. Company is considering to invest X dollars at 10% per year for three years. After three years, it is expected to receive a total of 10648, which is the sum. This is P, this is R, and this is N. So what we need to find out is the value of X, which is P. So P will be equal to S10648 into 1 plus 0.1 raised to the power minus 3. So it's $8,000. Be great. Uh, may I know the answer for example 2? Zair and Sakina has come up with the answer. Hiba, I'm afraid that your answer is not correct. So here we, again, we need to find the value of X, but this time the X is the rate of interest at which the amount is invested. So uh, a company is considering to invest, it's $15,000 investment, so P fifteen thousand dollars. Sum is one nine six six two. We need to find out the rate of interest, and since it's a four years project, so we'll just put four here. So is it seven percent? Is it 7%? Okay, all you have to do is to divide this figure here, and if you do so, you will get 1.3108 is equal to 1 plus r raised to the power 4. So to remove the power from here, we need to put a power as 1 upon 4 on the other side. So it will be 1 plus r is equal to 1.3108 raised to the power 1 upon 4. So if we solve it, are we going to get 7%? So I don't have a scientific calculator at the moment with me, so I'm sure the answer to this question will be 7%. Seven percent, right? So I hope it's clear. It's it's a seven percent approximately. Should we move forward? A 
Okay, just forget about effective rate. Let's jump to, our, to the net present value. Now, now, one of the key syllabus areas of financial management is investment appraisal. Now, investment appraisal is actually appraising a project before it could actually be accepted. A company, a company's management may have two or three options or one option or more than one option to select from it. Before the company decides to go for a particular project, it must evaluate, appraise a project. And if it finds the project feasible, if it finds the project attractive from both from financial and non-financial perspectives, only then the company will accept a particular project. So we're not discussing the non-financial aspect at the moment. We'll be discussing the financial aspect of accepting a project. So if you want to accept any particular project, you must evaluate from financial point of view first before you can actually go for it. So there are different ways which can be used to evaluate a project and one of those ways is the net present value. So before we move forward and go deep into what net present value is, let's first uh, start with a very basic example to see what net present value is. Suppose that Mr. A is considering to invest an amount in a project and the amount to be invested is $10,000. Now, let's say it's a one-year project and after one year, Mr. A will receive a total of $12,000. The amount to be invested in this project is a cash outflow for Mr. A. And the amount that he will be receiving after one year or after the end of the project is cash inflow. Now apparently it seems a very good project as $10,000 are required to be invested today and $12,000 will be received uh, in a year's time. So apparently it seems an, an attractive project but this is not a straightforward decision because the amount to be invested is required to be invested at point zero and what the Mr. A is going to receive will be in years time. So there is a one year difference between the cash outflow and the cash inflow. And if we look at from Mr. A's perspective or let's take it from a company's perspective. The company is required to invest $10,000 but as you know that every company is considered as a separate legal entity from its investors. So these $10,000 will be generated by the company either through equity that is raising shares share capital or borrowing from a bank so from whoever this company takes these ten thousand dollars <coughs> will certainly require a return on investment so the company has to make sure that it earns 
or generates enough returns to satisfy its investors. Let's say the investors require 10% per annum return against their investments. So the company has to make sure that it earns at least 10% from the investment. Now, just for the time being, ignore the amount of investment required for this project. And let's find out what maximum should the company invest for these $12,000. As you know, the minimum that the company would like to have is to recover the initial investment and the 10% return on investment. This is the minimum that a com company would like to generate from a particular project. At the moment, this company is going to get $12,000 at the end of year one. So if we assume that the company is going to invest X dollars for these $12,000. So the company will have to make sure that whatever cash inflow it generates should at least recover the amount invested plus the 10% return on that amount. So this company would like $12,000 to be equal to the amount invested and 10% of this amount invested. So company would like 12,000 to be some of these two. So if you try to find out from the help of this equation, what maximum amount should this company invest against these $12,000 to ensure that it recovers its investment and the return on investment. So can you people just solve this equation to find out the value of X for me. I want everyone to come up with the answer. Thank you, Mariam. Yes, it's the correct answer. And I want everybody else to solve the equation for X. Just two answers. Great. Yeah, it's 10909. What does this mean? This means that miss, this company needs to invest a maximum of 10909 if it really wants to recover its amount invested and 10% of the amount invested. So if it invests 10909 today, after year one, when it will have to return the amount invested to the investors and the 10% return. So if you just take 10% of 10909, it will be 1091. So to satisfy the investors, this company needs to generate 10909 and 1091 after the end of the project. If we sum these two cash flows, it will give us a total of $12,000 and it is exactly what is being generated from this project, $12,000. So what this, what this example is telling us that this company should not invest more than $10909 for these $12,000. 
it should invest a maximum of 10909 now now this figure will be compared with the actual investment required in this project the actual investment required for this project is ten thousand dollars whereas the maximum that this company can afford to invest for this project is one zero nine zero nine dollars so my question to all of you is should the company go for this project Well, let me let me repeat according to what we have solved the maximum amount required to be invested for this project is 10909 because if this company invests 10909 today and its investors require a return of 10% that is 10% of 10909 which is equal to 1091 so after year one it will have to pay back its investors an amount equal to 10909 if it invests this amount today and in years time it will also have to pay 10 percent of this investment which is 1091 to its investors so it means it will have to pay back a total of twelve thousand dollars to its investors which includes the investment and the return on investment so it will be twelve thousand dollars and this is exactly what will be generated from this project now according to the example the actual required investment is ten thousand dollars whereas the maximum that this company can afford to invest is one zero nine zero nine even if the company invests one zero nine zero nine it will it won't be at loss it will be exactly able to generate to recover its investment and return on investment but the required investment is just ten thousand dollars which is nine zero nine dollar less than the maximum to be invested since this company is going to save nine zero nine dollars if it invests ten thousand dollars today therefore this company should go for this investment is it clear okay let me explain it again we just calculated this figure that is the amount that this company should invest it was one zero nine zero nine Investing 10909 for $12,000 means if if this company invests $10909 today, if it invests $10909 today, after one year, it will have to pay back this amount to its investors plus it's the ten percent of this amount to its investors which will be one zero nine one dollars it means that the company needs twelve thousand dollars that is the sum of these two to recover the investment and the return on investment and twelve thousand dollar is what actually it is going to receive from this project so it means that even if this company invests ten thousand nine hundred and nine dollars in this project it won't be at loss is that clear if this company invests one zero nine zero nine today and receives twelve thousand dollars after year one it won't be at loss so the company will have made up its mind that it is going to invest up to one zero nine zero nine dollars now since the required investment is just ten thousand dollars which is less than one zero nine zero nine which the company is ready to invest 
so the company after investing ten thousand dollars will actually save nine zero nine dollars therefore the company will be going for this type of project is it clear now okay great now what this these nine one zero nine zero nine dollar tell us one zero nine zero nine dollars how we can calculate in any other way it's actually the present value because it's it's the amount that the company needs to invest so it's a present value that is the amount without interest so we can calculate this figure by the formula that we just read a few slides back 1 plus r raised to the power minus n so for s we will just put 12000 for r we'll just put 0 0.1 and since we need to find out the present value for a cash flow that is going to be received in one year's time the power will be minus one so can you just solve it again and tell me what will be the value of p okay it's again one zero nine zero nine So since $12,000 were cash inflows, we can say that 10909 is actually the present value of cash inflow. So the present value of cash inflow is actually the maximum amount that a company should invest in a particular project. It's the maximum that a company should invest in a project. Remember this. Now, once we have calculated the present value of cash inflow, cash inflow, we will then compare it with the amount required for the investment, which is the present value of cash outflow so the present value of cash inflow in this example was 10909 whereas the required investment which is the present value of cash outflow was equal to ten thousand dollars and since the present value of cash inflow was higher than the actual required investment the company was saving nine zero nine dollars since this amount 909 is the net of two present values the two present values therefore we call it net present value and whenever we find this net present value positive we should accept the project as it tells us that the required investment is lower than the maximum that a company should invest so the positive net present value suggests that if the company accepts this project it will gain from accepting the project is it clear so this is the basic concept of net present value so from now onwards do remember one thing whenever we will be calculating present value of a particular cash inflow it will tell us the maximum amount that a company should invest for a project so let's move forward to to the next slide and in this example it's actually the same example so let's move towards the next one a company is considering to invest $12,000 in one year's project after the end of which it is expecting to receive a total of $13,000 if the cost of the company is 10% which 
based on the NPV suggest whether the company should undertake this project or not. Just go ahead and calculate the net present value of this project. First of all, we need to calculate the present value of the cash inflows. So the amount that the company is going to receive, which is $13,000. So we need to find out the present value for $13,000. 1.1 raised to the power minus 1. May I know what is the present value of $13,000? Okay, 11818. So this is the maximum that should be invested for these cash flows if the company really wants to generate a 10% return from this project. But if the company invests more than this amount, it will be at loss. If it invests less than this amount, it will be at gain. So now let's compare with the actual required investment. And remember the company should not be investing more than $11,818. So the required investment is $12,000, which is above $11,818. And the difference is $182. Since the required investment is higher than what should be invested, therefore the company should not invest in this project. Is it clear? Let's move forward. Just uh, solve this question. Okay, I just want all of you to solve the next two questions, example two and example three for me. And uh, just give me five minutes. I'll be back in five minutes. Meanwhile, you people solve these two questions. Is that okay? Okay, just uh, solve example two and three. I'll be back in five minutes.
Hi, I'm back. So, uh, the amount to be received in three years time is $22,000. The rate of return required is 8%, so we'll just put 1.08. And since it's a three years project, so we'll put minus three. So what's the present value of $22,000? One, seven, four, six, four. Four, six, four, okay. So this is what should be invested at max for this project. Whereas the required investment is less than this and it will give a positive NPV of 2464. Therefore, it should be accepted on financial ground. So let's uh, move towards the next example, example three. And uh, the difference between this example and the previous example is that uh, in previous example, the company was going to receive $22,000 at the end of the third year and nothing was supposed to be received in year one and year two. But in this example, this project is generating cash inflows after the end of every single year for three years. So since the cash flows are generated uh, in every year, so the present value for each cash inflow will be calculated separately as the years are different. So first of all, we will be calculating the present value of $10,000 that will be received after the end of year one. The rate of interest is 10%. So 10,000 into 1.1 raised to the power minus one. May I know the present value? Then we'll be solving 11,000 into 1.1 raised to the power minus two. Then we'll have $12,000 into 1.1 raised to the power minus three. So for the first cash flow, it's $9090. May I know for the year two? So for year two, it's approximately the same, 9090. And for year three, it's 9015 or $16. Okay, 9090. 9090 and 9015. So now we need to sum all these cash present values to see what's the total amount that should be invested for this project. 27195. So uh, the maximum that this company should invest for this project is 27. 195 whereas the required investment is just $25,000 which is lower than the maximum that should be invested. So it's 2195 approximately positive. Therefore on financial grounds it should be accepted. Adam, uh, we will be using the NPV table values. So So I hope this example is clear to everyone. Yeah, I'm not using at the moment because I haven't taught what those table values are. So in a while I'll be just sharing
Now, okay, as as you all know, we calculated the present value of nine zero nine zero by multiplying ten thousand with one point one raised to the power minus one. See if 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 instead of calculating the present value of ten thousand dollars. If we were to calculate the present value of one dollar instead of ten thousand dollars, that is, if I ask you how much should be invested, how much should be invested for a one dollar which will be received in a year's time, how much maximum should be invested today? For a one dollar to be received in one year's time. In that case, we'll write one dollar instead of ten thousand. One point one raised to the power minus one. So may I know the value? Yeah, point nine zero nine. Point nine zero nine dollar. What does this tell us? This point nine zero nine dollar means that if a company wants to generate a return of ten percent, it should invest point nine zero nine dollars today against one dollar to be received in one year's time. The maximum that should be invested for one dollar to be received in one year's time should be 0 0.909, provided that the company needs to generate a return of 10%. So for every one dollar that it receives in one year's time, it should invest 0 0.909 dollars. This value, which is the present value of one dollar, is called discount factor. Discount factor is actually the present value of one dollar. Now it will make things very simple if if we know what's the present value of one dollar. It will be very easy for us to find out the value of any number of dollars if we know the present value of one dollar. All we have to do is to multiply with the cash flow to get the present value. Like in this example, as I told you that. For every one dollar to be received in one year's time, we need to invest 0 0.909 dollar today if we need to generate a 10% return. So for every one dollar, it should be 0 0.909. Then how much should be invested for ten thousand dollars, which will be received in one year's time? We just need to multiply it. So if we multiply ten thousand by 0 0.909, which is the discount factor, we will get the present value 9090. So for 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 year one, this is what the present value of one dollar will be. Now let's see what should be invested for one dollar that will be received in two years time. If I ask you what should be invested today for one dollar that will be received in two years time from now. So again, we'll write one here. The rate of interest is the same 10 percent, but the power in this case will be minus two as this one dollar will be received in two years time. So definitely we will be investing less than. The previous value because this amount will be now received in two years time. So the company will be investing 0.826 today so that when it receive one dollar after two years it will be able to generate its 10 percent per annum return so for every one dollar to be received in two years time the company is is going to be investing 0.826 so if this is for one dollar then what should be invested for the total eleven thousand dollars we just need to multiply simple 
we'll get the same present value. In the same way, if we need to calculate the present value of $1 to be received in three years time from now, what will be the answer? May I know the present value of $1 to be received in three years time? 1751. So for third year, the discount factor should be 0.751. Now, if we multiply 12,000 by 0.751, it will approximately give me the same value as 9015. So it would be too convenient for us if we know these discount factors in advance all we need to pick the relevant discount factors and then multiply it with the cash flows to get the present values. So in the exams, you people will be given a table called present value table and it will be in this form as in on your screens. So what we need to do is to pick the relevant column, which will depend on the discount rate that we are using. And it will depend on the value of N. Like in our example, it was 10%. So for year one, it was 0 0.909. For year two, it was 0 0.826. And for year three, it was 0 0.751. Remember the whole table shows present values of $1 at different rate and different timing. So we need to pick up the relevant discount factors from this table and just put it in our example and find out the present values. Mariam, uh, haven't you people downloaded and print, taken the printout of these PowerPoint, this PowerPoint presentation? Uh, you people were supposed to uh, download and uh, take the ha hard copy print out of these questions and so that you could easily uh, note it down whatever I'm writing. So let's move forward and solve another question and this time you need to solve this question using discount factors. Remember the discount factor column should be for 10% and it should be for year one, year two and year three. So what discount factor should I write for year one? 0.9015. Right. Point 826 and 0.751. So these values will just be copied from the discount factor table and we just need to multiply these two values to get the present value. So what will be the present value of 15,000? One, three, six, three, five. Great. And then for 20,000? One, six, five, two, zero, right? And for the next? One, eight, seven, seven, five. So let's just add all these values. Four, eight, nine, three, zero. And then
3930, right? Okay, let's move forward to the fifth example. In the fifth example, I have already put the discount factors at the rate of 8%. So you just, you people need to multiply the figures and tell me the present values. Two, three, one, five, zero. Okay. What's next? Two, one, four, two, five, two, one, four, two, five. And what's next? One, nine, eight, five, zero. And what's the total? Total of these three. Oh, quick enough. Oh, which of the two is correct? Okay, six, four, four, two, five. Six, four, four, two, five. So it means it's a four, four, two, five dollar positive NPV. Okay, now I, I, I want everybody to listen and watch very carefully. If you just note that we are receiving same cash flows after the end of every year. When we receive same amount every year, this is an annuity project. This same amount received every year is called annuity. So annuity is a constant amount received after regular intervals. So it's an NVT project. Now, if you look at this value, this has been calculated by taking the sum of the products of these values. Now, if I take 25,000 as a common value, And I sum all these three values, that is the discount factors. May I have the sum of these three discount factors? Two point five seven seven. Okay. The sum of discount factors is called NVT factor, or you may call it cumulative discount factor. This 2.577 is actually the sum of the first three years discount factors. So instead of multiplying the individual values with 25,000, if you just multiply this annuity factor, which is 2.577 with the amount of annuity, we'll get the present value directly. 6, 4, 2, 5. So if we know the annuity factor, all we have to do is to multiply this factor with the annuity, we'll get the present value of all cash inflows. And then later we will deduct the in initial investment to get the net present value. Now from where we are going to get this 2.577? We have a formula for calculating annuity factor, which is one, minus 1 plus r raised to the power minus n divided by whole divided by r so we can use this formula for calculating annuity factor this is one way of getting this annuity factor the other way of getting the same annuity factor is using the annuity table like the discount factor table we have a table which shows the sum of the discount factors called NVT factor table. So if we go back to those two tables, if you look at this table, 
none of these values none of these values is more than one all these values are less than one because these are simple discount factors but if you look at the next table you can see all the values in the first row are less than one because it is just for one year but in the second row the values are more than one because th these values show the sum of discount factors so for in our case the discount rate was 8% so we'll just go to the 8% column and since we needed the sum of first three years we'll directly go to the third row of the same column and we can see the discount annuity factor which is 2.577 but remember at any point say for example if we go to fifth year the fifth year value is actually the sum of discount factor from year one to year five if we go to the sixth row this is the sum of the discount factors from year one to six so all these values start from year one so these show the sum of discount factor starting from year one so we just need to pick the annuity factor from this table make sure you are look you are looking at the annuity factor table and not the discount factor table and make sure that you know the difference between the two discount factor table shows present values of one dollar only at any particular point of time whereas the annuity factor table shows the sum of the discount factors for any number of years so so we can pick up the discount annuity factor from that table and multiply it with the annuity to get the present value so let's move forward just to go ahead and solve this question for me remember the difference between this question and the previous example is that it starts from year zero so you just forget this amount just forget this amount for the time being and you just solve it in a normal way assuming that it starts from year one and ends at year three Can you people just tell me the annuity factor? Remember, we are just ignoring this first cash flow. We're just ignoring this for the time being. So may I know the discount, may I know the annuity factor? Since we are ignoring the first cash inflow, so it's just a normal project starting from year one and ending at year 3n so it would be 2.577 now if I just multiply this 2.577 with 15,000 it will give me the present value of cash flows starting from year 1 to the end of year 3 but in this project it is clearly mentioned that the project is expected to generate cash inflows of $15,000 per year with first one due now. So it's a four years project with the first cash flow to be received immediately. That is at point zero. So zero, one, two, three. But we, but we, if we just multiply it with 2.577, we'll just get the present value from year one to year three, which will not be the correct answer. So what we need to do is 
we'll just pick the discount NVT factor from year one to year three from the table as the table will always show the NVT factor from year one onwards. So it's 2.577. And remember one thing, any cash flow which is received or paid immediately at point zero will have a discount factor equal to one. It will always have a discount factor e equal to one. So we'll just add one for this point zero cash inflow. So whenever we are supposed to receive a cash inflow immediately, we'll just add one to our NVT factor. So it will be 3.577 multiplied with 15,000. May I know the answer? Five, three, six, five, five. Now this is the present value of cash inflows from year zero to year three. Now it, it includes the present value of all cash for cash inflows. Then we need to subtract 40,000 to get the net present value. One, three, six, five, five dollars. But we can also solve this question using this tabular approach. But definitely it will take time. We have to calculate present value of every cash flow separately and then add. But if we do so, we'll get the same answer as we've done so. Is it clear? Okay, let me give you, you give you an alternative way of solving the same question. And it will also give you the same answer. Just look at the formula above. Present value of advance annuity. Just write down the annuity, which is 15,000. Multiply it with the annuity factor. Forget about the advance thing. Just focus on the project life. It's a four year project. So just pick the four years annuity factor and just forget that you are receiving something in advance. So a four year project, therefore we should take a four year NVT factor. So may I know the four, four years NVT factor? 3.312. Okay. If it was an ordinary NVT of a four year project that is starting from year one to year four, we call it an ordinary NVT. We wouldn't be required to do anything else. So we just had to multiply 15,000 by 3.312 to get the present value. But since it's an advanced entity, we have to multiply it with one plus R. So just multiply it with one plus R. R is 8%, so we just need to write as 0 0.08. So 15,000 into 3.312, that is the four years annuity factor, and then multiply it with 1.08 to adjust the impact of advanced annuity. May I know the answer? So it's approximately the same five, three, six, five, four. Shoaib, just, just you need, just need to recalculate the figure. It's not seventy-eight thousand. So it's five three six five five or five four approximately the same minus forty thousand and it will be one three six five four. So we've got three ways of calculating the same. One is the tabular approach. The other is just picking up three years annuity factor and add one and multiply it with fifteen thousand. And in the second example, uh, in the third approach, you just need to write the annuity figure fifteen thousand pick up the NVT factor for the project life, that is four years, and then multiply it with one plus R, that is the discount rate. Ali, 3.312 is the NVT factor for four years project. If you just look at the NVT factor table, 
I hope you have the enmity factor table. Go to the eight person column. Go to the eight person column and look at the fourth row. Can't we keep it simple? Just ask him. Well, there are three different approaches, uh, Saad. It's up to you which approach you feel is simple. You can use it. I have told you all three approaches, and it's totally up to the student which approach uh, he or she uses. So why did you cut and change the year? OK, actually, it was a mistake. Uh, Nakib, it was a mistake. It's it's a four-year project because there are four cash flows involved. And we can't have four cash inflows in a three years project. Usually you will get profit every year. So if there are four cash inflows involved, it means that it's a four years project. So it was a misprint, a typo, which I corrected. So, uh, okay, just quickly, uh, let me just make a few changes to the question and uh, I want you people to solve this question for me. A company is considering to invest $32,000 in a five years project and the project is expected to generate eleven thousand dollars per year with first one due now if the cost of capital is ten percent calculate the NPV of the project so I've made few changes to the question just quickly solve the question for me and it's totally up to you people which approach you people use I would suggest to stick to one approach so that you don't get confused in, in the exams. Wow, too many variations. We have already got three different net present values. I just loved the creative of creativity of you people. You're coming up with very creative answers and it's, it's good. Well, looking at your creativity, I believe you people will be ending up working with in, in high tech companies. Okay. Okay. So let's uh Let's uh, let's use this project, this uh, this this approach. 
uh, uh, the annuity is eleven thousand dollars every year the annuity factor should be equal to the project's life which is five years so we just need to pick annuity factor at ten percent for five years so just let's go go back to the table and see what annuity factor do we have for the fifth year ten percent and it's three point seven nine one Three point seven nine one. Remember, three point seven nine one is calculated on the assumption that the first cash inflow will be received in one year's time. Whereas, according to this question, the first cash inflow is going to be received at point zero. So it means it's an annuity project. It's an advanced annuity project. So we have to multiply it with one plus r, which is one plus point one. So eleven thousand into Five years annuity factor into 1.1 for the advanced annuity. So, may I know what's the answer? Four, five, eight, seven, one. And then We'll just subtract 32,000 from it. So it will be 13871 dollars. So anyone who has come up with a different answer will get full marks for the creativity, but no marks for the correct answer. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> so, uh, should we move forward? Sir, do it on the f first method. Okay. Okay, the first method was uh, since this project will start from point zero then there will be one two three and then four so one two three four five five years five payments so it means it will end at year four so what we need to do is just pick an annuity factor for year four which will be 3.170 3.170 multiplied with 11,000 but this 3.170 is for, for year 1 to year 4 and we are also going to receive something at point 0 so we have to add 1 so this is for 4 years and this is for year 0 so the, in total there will be 5 years so 11,000 should be multiplied with 4.170 So it's four five eight seven zero four five eight seven zero minus thirty two thousand one three eight seven zero approximately the same answer. So I hope it's clear. Uh, uh, Abdullah, is it clear? Okay, let's move forward. So I hope now you, you people have got the the, uh, you've got the difference between an ordinary annuity which starts from year one and an advanced annuity which starts from year zero. So make sure in the exam question you, 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 people, are, you people are able to identify whether a project is an advanced annuity project or is it an ordinary annuity project. So like oh, five minutes break please. Uh, Okay, let's let's take a five minutes break. So let's take a five minutes break and uh, come back after five minutes.
Yeah, Uzair, you're absolutely right. Eight years means payment at the end of every year. Well, uh, Russia, we, 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 we have done uh, basic calculation for NPV. We are done with the advance annuity. We are done. We are just about to start the delayed annuity now. Uh, Abu Bakr, yes, I will, I will uh, guide you uh, as the session uh, progresses. Uh, I'll guide you about the theoretical questions and uh, about the um, multiple choice questions as well. We'll be solving the, the multiple choice questions as well. And I, I, I'll also be sharing uh, my WhatsApp group link with all of you so that you can join that group and we, we can always have discussion on that group as well.
No, Abdullah, I haven't forgot it. We will discuss it later. So let's start again. Now, now as uh, we saw, there, there was an ordinary enmity starting in one year's time. There was an advanced enmity starting in from year zero. And we can also have delayed enmity uh, which uh, which may start beyond year one that is may, it may start from year two and onwards so what how to calculate the present value for for a project uh, that will start from year two onwards so if you look at this example the company is considering to invest thirty thousand dollars in a six years project it's a key remember this project has a six years life so it means the last payment that will be received will be at the end of the sixth year so no payment is going to be received after year six. The project is expected to generate cash inflows of 14,000 per year, but more importantly, it is starting from year three. So it means that we are not going to receive anything at the end of year one, and we are not going to receive anything at the end of year two. So the very first payment that we will be receiving will be from the end of year three. The cost of capital is 10%. So we, we have a tabular approach. Let's first solve it using the tabular approach and then we'll move towards the formula approach and we'll reconcile uh, whether the answer, the answers match or not. So uh, since it starts from year three, so I haven't written year one and year two, there's no point of writing it if we don't have any cash flow at those two years. So from year three onwards and it will end at the sixth year. So 10%. So we have to pick the discount factor for year three, which is 0.751, then 0.683, then 0.621, 0 0.654. So if you can just quickly tell me the answers. 10514, thank you. What's next? On your screens, you people have the link to join my WhatsApp group. Okay, next is 9562. Eight six nine four seven eight nine six. Okay, thank you. And now, may I have the sum of all these cash flows? Six thousand six hundred and sixty six. Too many sixes. Okay, so it's six 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 six. Okay, so uh, this is uh, the tabular approach, but definitely it's a very lengthier approach, so we, we can't use this approach in an exam. So let's uh, use this formula for. To solve this question, according to this formula, we need to pick up the enmity, which is fourteen thousand, multiplied with the enmity factor. Now, which enmity factor? Here you go, enmity factor for the number of payments. So we need to find out the number of payments that we are going to receive throughout the life of the project. So uh, since it's a six-year project, and we were told that the first payment will be received at the end of year three. So out of six years, we won't be getting anything for the first two years. That is, we won't be getting two payments. So if out of six payments, we won't be getting two payments. That means we will be getting four payments. So since we'll be getting four payments, so we have to take enmity factor for four years and not six years. Remember this, the enmity factor should be for the number of payments. So there are four payments in this project. So we'll go back to the enmity factor table and see what enmity factor do we have for year four at 10%. This is 10% and for year four, it's 3.170. 
So three point one seven zero. So this is the NVIDIA factor, and then it it says that we need to multiply it with the discount factor. Now, which discount factor? The discount factor for the number of years delayed beyond year one. Now, as you all know, that the ordinary NVT starts from year one, whereas this project is starting from year three. That is, it is starting to generate cash inflows from year three. So the gap between an ordinary NVT and this NVT is two years. Usually it starts from year one, and here it is starting from year three. So we can say there's a delay of two years. So the discount factor should be equal to the number of years delayed. So if you can just go back to discount factor table, go to the 10 person column and look at the discount factor at year two. May I know what's the discount factor for year two at 10 percent? It's the NVT factor, Iram. Remember, we won't use two NVT factors. We have already used the NVT factor. Now we are going to use the discount factor and not the NVT factor. It's 0.826. Abdullah, it's the NVT factor. Remember, we have to use discount factor and not the NVT factor. And everybody should understand the difference between NVT factor and discount factor. When I say we have to use discount factor, make sure that you're using discount factors. And when NVT factor is required, make sure that you're using NVT factor. So it's NVT factor 0.826. So just multiply 14,000 by 3.17 and then multiply it with 0.826. It's three, six, six, five, seven, approximately the same. It's just because of the rounding off thing. Minus thirty thousand. So it will be six, six, five, seven. A nine dollars difference because of rounding off. So this is one of the ways we can solve this question. Is it clear to everyone? Okay, now just, just follow. I'm just going to tell you another way of solving this question and probably uh, it, you will feel it more simple approach. Uh, In the 10 person column, go to the sixth year NVT factor. Since it's a six years project, if we pick this factor, remember it will include all the discount factors from year one to year six. So if we take this NVT factor and multiply it with the cash inflows, it means we have assumed that we are going to receive something at the end of year one and something at the year and year, end of year two as well. But in, in according to the question, it's not the case. So what we need to do is just from this figure, subtract a two years NVT factor. So from a six years NVT factor, if we deduct a two years NVT factor, we'll be left with the sum of the discount factors for the rest of the four years. That is year three, year four, year five, and year six. So 4.355 minus two years NVT factor. May I know what will be the answer? 2.1 2.619. So instead of using any other approach, we can just take this as our enmity factor and multiply it with the cash inflows that we were receiving every after every year. What was what were the cash flows? Fourteen thousand. So if 
we multiply 14,000 by 2.619, we will almost get the same answer. Fourteen thousand into two point six one nine, thirty six thousand six hundred and sixty six. So we can also use this approach as well. Now it's totally up to you people which approach you use. Ali, as far as the decimal places are concerned, usually we use uh, up to two decimal places. But in certain cases, like in risk management, um, we use up to four decimal places as well. But usually we use uh, figures up to two decimal places. Yeah, Iram, you're absolutely right. It's the NVT factor for the last four years for the project of the project. So any questions? Which method is more preferable in the exam? The key, it's totally up to you. It's totally up to the students. So which method they use as far as the answer answers are same. Uh, it, it does not make any difference which method you use. Any questions or should I move forward? Okay. Go ahead and solve this question. Don't use a tabular approach. It will take some time. Use it at home. Uh, just solve this question using the rest, either of the rest of the two methods. So, Keen, I didn't get your question. Answers values. Okay, uh, yeah, answers uh, are different, but the variation isn't that big that you may not be able to pick up the right option. Uh, if you have an MCQ uh, in the question in the exams, uh, the, your answer will be very close to one of the four options, and you'll have to choose that. Unable to join the WhatsApp group. Why is that? So, just just uh, Adil, you just look at at your end because uh, I can see students joining the group. So it means there is no problem at my end. Maybe there's some problem at your end. Okay, Khalid, you also you're also facing the same problem. Maybe uh, while copying the link, you may be copying the space as well. Just look at. Uh, make sure that you're not adding any space in the link. Okay, it's a it's a eight years project. So the NVT seventeen thousand. It's a eight years project, but we don't need to pick up eight years NVT factor under this approach. We just need to find out the number of payments for this project. So in an eight years project, if you are not going to receive anything for the first three years, it means you are not going to receive three payments out of eight payments. So out of eight payments, 
if we are not receiving three payments, it means we are receiving the other five payments. So the NVT factor used should be for five years. So can I have NVT factor at 12% for five years? Three point six zero five. Adam, I hope uh, you have picked up for the five for the fifth year as well for the fifth year. Okay, seventeen thousand into three point six zero five. Now multiplied with the years with the discount factor for the years delayed. So since uh, in in a normal annuity we we start receiving a cash inflow from year one. Here we are receiving it from year four. So how many years delay? is there three years delay yeah so we have to find we have to pick three years discount factor so can I have the three years discount factor at 12 percent point seven one two okay so what's the pr answer of these three values Four three six three five. Okay. The amount of investment is sixty thousand dollars. So if the company goes ahead with this project, it will be having a negative NPV of one three one six three seven three six five, right? Okay, let's move forward to the next example. Of course, Ahmad, if I won't talk, how will you listen something? How will you hear it? Okay. Uh, enmity, which is uh, 14,000. The number of payments. If you look at this, it's, it's not a five years project. It says that the cash inflows of 14,000 per year for five years. So it has clearly told us how many payments are we going to receive. So we are going to receive five payments. So can I have a can I have an NVD factor for five years? 3.715. Okay, then we need a discount factor. So it is starting from year three. So we need a discount factor for year two. 0.826, yeah. So what's the present value? Four, three, eight, three, nine. Four, three, 
1.839 and the investment is 50,000 so there will be a, a negative NPV of 6161 dollars right I hope it's clear now. Okay, let's move forward. So let's uh, move towards perpetuity. Well, a perpetuity is an annuity that lasts forever. For example, if you if you buy a, uh, if you buy shares of a company, so you will be receiving dividends for an indefinite period of time. You, you will be receiving dividends till you hold the share. So the number of dividends that you are going to receive will be indefinite. So in case you are receiving cash inflows for indefinite period of time, such annuity is called perpetuity. For him, whether it's ordinary shares or it's irredeemable preference shares, in both cases, investor uh, investors received uh, dividends for indefinite period of time. So in that that that's the case of perpetuity. Now, how do we calculate present value for a perpetuity? Remember present value. I told you that present value for any given cash inflow is actually the maximum that a company should be willing to invest for a particular project. So whenever we are supposed to calculate present value for any cash inflow, we are actually calculating the maximum that one should invest for such cash flow. Now if you look at this example, example one, a company is expecting to receive $6,000 per year and it's an ordinary uh, and with you starting in one year's time but <coughs> excuse me but you will be receiving it in perpetuity means forever for indefinite period of time if the required investment is fifty thousand dollars and the cost of capital is ten percent what is the net present value of the project now since this company is going to receive six thousand dollars forever now it wants to consider how much should be invested for these six thousand dollars now remember the company needs to generate 10 percent return every year so it will not invest any amount for this project which will result in a lower return than 10 percent now, if this company is receiving 6,000 every year, we need to find out what amount should this company invest at max to be sure that it generates at least 10% return. So we don't know that amount. So we'll just suppose that it's X amount. And this company wants this X amount to be such that when it takes 10% of this amount, it equals $6,000. If this happens, it means this company will generate 10%. So we just need to find out 6,000 is 10% of which amount. So we just divide it by 10% and we will come to know what should the maximum value be so can i have the value of x yep sixty thousand dollars yeah excellent so it means that if this company invests sixty thousand dollars in this project and takes 10% of the 60,000, which will be equal to 6,000, it means it will be generating 10% per annum. 
So investing 60,000 and then getting 6,000 in return means that this company is generating 10%. So it will not invest any amount above $60,000 for this project. But fortunately, the required investment is less than 60,000. It's just $50,000 for the same 6,000. So the, this is the present value, 60,000. And this is the required investment, which is 10,000 lower than the required, in, uh, lower than 60,000. Therefore, the company will have a positive NPV of $10,000. So the very simple formula for calculating present value of annuity or present value of perpetuity will be very simple. Annuity, that is 6,000 divided by discount rate, which was 10%. Uh, here we go, $60,000. That's it. So these $60,000 uh, are actually the maximum that this company should be investing against the $6,000 that it will be receiving every year for forever. I hope it's clear. Okay, whatever the case is in case of perpetuity, the first step will be to divide NVT by the discount rate. In any case, if it's a perpetuity project, all you have to do is to divide the NVT by your discount rate. Once you have done this, then you have to look at whether it's a, it's ordinary NVT. If it's ordinary NVT, do nothing. You've got the present value. But if it's advanced NVT, then you'll have to do the same thing which we did in case of advanced NVT. So in case of advanced perpetuity, you just need to multiply this fraction by 1 plus R. Just multiply it by 1 plus R. Okay. Just quickly solve the second example. It's it's for the advanced NVT. So the first step will be 8,000 divided by 0 0.08. This will be the first step. And since it's advanced NVT, first one due now, we have to multiply it with 1.08 as well. So it will be equal to 108,000. And then we need to subtract the initial investment 60,000, so it's $48,000 NPV. So, is it clear? Yeah, Ali, it's 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 for delayed perpetuity. The next example is the same. So now let's move towards the delayed perpetuity example. Again, as I told you that whatever the case will be, the first step in perpetuity project will always be to divide NVT or perpetuity by the discount rate. So 9,000 per year divided by 0 0.08. This is the very first step that should be done every time. But since it's a delayed NVT, so we have to multiply it with the discount factor as we did in delayed NVT case. In this question, it is starting from year three, four. So for how many years it has been delayed? May I know the number of years delayed? Yes, it's three years. Because it's it, it's it was supposed to start from year one, but it is starting from year four. So there is a three years delay. So at 8%, may I know the third year's discount factor? Iram, again, you are picking up the NVT factor. We need a discount factor for year three.
0.794 yeah it's 0.794 so because of the delay we are multiplying it with the discount factor so what's the answer eight nine three zero six and the initial investment is forty thousand so the net present value will be four nine three zero six It's eight nine two three five. It won't make that difference. It's it's almost the same value. You know, eight nine three zero five or it's eight nine three two five. That not not a big difference. So that was perpetuity. Uh, so we're done with perpetuity in start, starting in one year time. That is ordinary perpetuity. We are done with the advanced perpetuity and then the delayed perpetuity. In case uh, the WhatsApp is not working, you people can text me on WhatsApp using this number Do I really need to repeat the mobile number? It's right at the top of the screen. Here is. And we also need your honest feedback as well. Just give us your honest feedback. Okay, let's uh, move forward to our last topic of the day that is the internal rate of return uh, for this particular part I would like attention from your side it's a bit technical uh, if you just look at this example uh, here's there's a project uh, which has two different net present values at two different discount rates. So uh, at, at a 10% discount rate, when we, we, we discounted this project at 10%, we got a positive NPV of 2000. So what does this tell us? This tells us that we are earning more than 10%, so we should accept this project, right? If, if, we, if we require a 10% rate of return, then it's a very good project because it is giving us more than 10%. Right? But if the same project is discounted using 15% discount rate, it gives us a negative NPV of 500, which means that we should not accept this project if we require a 15% return from the project. Because at 15% discount rate, it's, it is giving us a negative NPV. 
So remember the 10% and the 15%, none of them are the required returns of the company. They are just being used and they're not the required return because you can't have two returns. A company will have only one re required rate of return. So they are just two assumed rates. We've just put 10% as a, as, as a discount rate and we've seen whether we are earning more than 10% or less than 10%. So according to this project's NPV, uh, a, a, this project is giving us a higher return than 10%. But at the same time, when we discounted this project at 15%, we've got negative NPV, which tells us that this project is giving us a lesser return than 15%. So the return of this project is somewhere between 10 and 15%. So we can say it's more than 10%, but less than 15%. But what actually the return is, we don't know. Now, if our cost of capital is 10%, we will accept this project because this is giving us more than 10%. But if our cost of capital, that is the required rate of return, is 15%, we will reject this project. Now, what if the cost of capital is in between 10 and 15%? Will we, will we be able to decide with this information, with the help of this information? No. If our re 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 required return is 10% or less, we should go for this project. If our required return is 15% or more than 15%, we'll reject this project. But if it's between 10 to 15%, we can't decide with the help of this information because we don't know what actually we are earning and what actually we want to earn. So for this, we must first find out the IRR of this project, that is the internal rate of return of this project. The internal rate of return of this project is the rate of discount rate at which NPV will be zero, which means we need to find out at what maximum discount rate the NPV will be zero. Say, for example, uh, just for the sake of example, if we assume that at 12%, the NPV is zero for this project. If I, if, if we are able to find out this 12% at which NPV is zero, what is going to do to us? As we know that this project has zero NPV at 12%, which means at 12%, cost of capital, this project will not save anything for the company. So the company should not accept this project if it needs a re return more than 12%. Say for example, if the cost of capital of the company is 14%, this company should not accept this project because it will not save anything at 12%. And at 14%, it will be at loss even. So if we are able to find out the rate at which NPV will be zero, it will help us to decide whether a project should be accepted or rejected. So this rate is called IRR. So now we have to find out this rate of return at which NPV will be zero. Is this clear? Okay, that the problem is how to how to find out a rate at which NPV will be zero. Since according to this question, at 10% the NPV is positive, at 15% it will be negative. So we can clearly see a relationship between the discount rate and NPV. When we increase our discount rate from 10 to 15%, we saw a fall in the NPV equal to 2,500 because it was 2,000 positive and now it has it is 500 negative, which means there is a difference of $2,500. So if we try to establish a relationship between NPV and the discount rate in this case, it is 
a total change in the NPV is of 2500 and I hope you will have got this this 2500 change from 2000 positive to 500 negative it's a 2500 change so there's a $2,500 change in the NPV because of the five percentage point change in the IRR. So a five percentage point change in IRR has resulted in a total change of $2,500 in NPV. So per percentage point change will be equal to May I know the per percentage point change in NPV? If 5% has resulted in 2500 change, then what change it will be there? What change will be there if we change it by only one percentage point? 500 divided by 5. 500. So every one percentage point in this case will change the NPV by $500. Now, if I tell you that we are standing at 2000 positive NPV and we want to reach to zero NPV and we know that every one percentage point change is going to bring $500 change in NPV and it's the inverse relationship. So if you want to reduce the NPV, we have to increase the discount rate. Here we have 10% cost of capital and we have a positive NPV of 2000. Now if we want to convert this 2000 positive into zero NPV, definitely we have to increase our discount rate. And remember every one percentage point is bringing 500 change in the NPV. So if we increase our discount rate, if we increase our discount rate by 1% only, the NPV will be equal to what? Just quickly, 1500, right? And then if we increase it further 1%, it will be reduced to 1000. If we increase a further 1%, it will be equal to 500. And if we increase it a further 1%, it will be equal to zero. So 10 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 will be 14%. So it means at 14%, cost of capital or discount rate, the NPV will be zero. So we have to increase our current discount rate of 10% by four percentage points. Now, how we can calculate this four percentage points is very simple. 2000 is what we need to change and each change is equal to 500. So if you want to change our discount rate, we have to change it by four percentage points. 2000 divided by 4 and at the moment it's 10 so if we increase by 4 it will be 14 percent so at 14 percent rate the NPV will be 0 and this is our IRR we can calculate the same value of 14 percent using this formula IRR is equal to a percent plus capital A divided by a minus B into B percent minus a percent whereas a percent is the lower rate out of these two rates a percent will be the lower rate which is 10 this is the lower rate a is the positive NPV which is 2000 a again it's 2000 minus and then minus B is the negative NPV which is 500 negative multiplied by the higher rate which is 15% minus the lower rate which is 10% now if you just can quickly solve this equation and tell me what's the answer Fourteen percent, yeah, right. So from now onwards, we'll be using this formula for calculating IRR. All this stuff was to explain what IRR is all about. 
So at 14%, this project will save nothing for the company. So the company will not accept this project if it has a higher cost of capital than 14%. But in case the company's cost of capital is less than 14%, it will accept this project. So at the moment, if you say, sir, what should we be doing at 14%? If the project's IRR is 14%, what should we be doing? We cannot decide. We cannot decide by looking at the IRR only. We must compare the IRR with the cost of capital or the required return of the company. IRR is simply telling you that the project will have no savings at 14% return, at 14% discount rate. So at 14% you won't save anything. Now just compare this 14% with your cost of capital. So the rule will be accept the project where IRR is greater than cost of capital. So remember a loan IRR will never ever help you decide. You must compare the IRR of the project with the required return or the cost of capital of the company and only accept the project if your IRR that is the rate at which the company the project is generating returns is higher than what is required by the company. Is it clear? I, I want everybody to say yes if it's clear so that I know that maximum people have understood what IRR is. Saad IRR is telling us at what rate the NPV will be zero. So if we know that at 14% NPV will be zero so we will not accept this project if our cost of capital is more than 14% because at more than 14% the NPV will be negative. So if the cost of capital is more than 14% it means we have to pay to our shareholders more than what we are earning from the project. So IRR is it tells you tells us what we are earning from the project. And cost of capital tells us what we are paying to our investors. So if the cost of capital is higher than the IRR it means we have to pay more whereas we are earning less, so we should not accept the project. Okay, Fahim, if cost of capital is equal to IRR, should we accept the project? Well, uh, don't expect that examiner will give you the situation where cost of capital is equal to IRR and then he will still ask you to decide whether to accept or reject because this will be purely on the, on the management, uh, whether they they, they, they are good enough, they're, they're happy with this return. But uh, in, in, uh, in, with, with objective answer, uh, I would say the company will be indifferent because if the cost of capital is equal to IRR, it means that the company will save nothing. But at least it will be able to satisfy its investors. So, so usually the company uh, will look for any other project which has a higher IRR than the cost of capital, but in case the company does not have any other project even with the cost of capital equal to IRR the company may go for it so that it can keep its investors satisfied. Okay uh, here in this question what is cost? Sakin uh, we, we haven't taken any cost of capital we were just learning how to calculate the IRR definitely in the exam question if we were to if we are to decide whether to go for a project they will give us the cost of capital. So here we don't have any cost of capital. We just calculated the IRR. So uh, I think uh, uh, it's enough for today. Uh, I want all of you uh, to go through what we have studied today uh, at home. And I would also like you to uh, go and watch my videos on uh, Vimeo. Uh, if you if you go to vimeo.com slash ACCA Pakistan ACCA Pakistan there you will find my uh, F9 videos for the previous sessions and uh, if you can just go and watch day one and day two of investment appraisal it will very be helpful and uh,
to tomorrow we will be solving the full length questions which you will be seeing in your section C of the syllabus. So uh, I hope uh, today's session was good. It was helpful for all of you. And uh, it's uh, goodbye. Have a good day. Thank you very much for the compliments. Bye-bye.